really appreciated. And without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Boris, when, when you're ready. Hi, Lisa. I am very impressed to be able to talk with the, the peripheral co-creator and executive producer. You have directed the great movie Reminiscence and working on such great series as Bird Night Eyes, Wet's World. What do you like so much on the William Gibson's book, please? Um, well, thank you. I, I am a huge fan of William Gibson's and what I love most about any story is when it, you can talk about the world and examine the world and it forms a kind of allegorical mirror to society, but you're also looking at people on a very human and intimate scale, people that you can relate to, characters that you feel like you know or that you want to know. And this book had such a great combination of that sort of futurism and philosophy and technology, but also heart. And that's what I think grounds this entire um, series is the heart of its characters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great, I think it's me up next. Um, my first question is for Tania. Um, I was wondering, we uh, we haven't been given all of the episodes, so I don't know exactly uh, where things are heading, but certainly in the early episodes, your character is depicted in a very kind of sinister uh, light. So I just wanted to ask, how did you find playing the villain uh, in, in this project and what can you tease about your character's arc in this season? I mean, you know, it's always... I always think that the villainous characters are far more interesting to play, especially when she is as charismatic and charming um, and, to use the word, uh, has such agency, right, uh, in a way that we don't normally see women portrayed on screen. Um, I, I, would, I would say that, although, yeah, she's, she, she's painted as a villain. I think she's called the Baal, the Queen Bee. <laughs> that's how it, yeah she's described as but no it no all, all isn't as it seems there's a reason so there's a method for her madness there's a reason why she's so, she's so persistent at, at any cost and you know she really is there for the collective i believe she's really there for the collective and greater good in her in her mind at least you know and she has made a, a real contribution to the, the world that she lives in that is benefiting all which you'll find out what episode did you get up to? Uh, so, well, they've given us six episodes. I'm currently up to episode three. I've been trying to get through as much as I can, but busy week so far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm, I look forward to you enjoying it. Love I've that. got a lot more to find out. I look, for, I look forward to you enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> but you will. Hi, Tania. Hi, Lisa. I'm Karen Pereira from Times of India. Lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Uh, so uh, there are so many uh, badass female characters in this uh, series. Uh, what, was, what was it like, uh, you know, bringing them into the sci-fi genre that is uh, not so, uh, like, you know, you don't, you don't normally find that. Uh, you don't find females ex uh, exploring this genre too much. So what was it like... Uh, getting that on board in this series? Well, I was um, very fortunate in that when I read the book by Gibson, I saw, okay, well, there's Cerise and there's Alita and there's Flynn. And I immediately, I think it was, it was truly the female characters who made me understand this is something that we have to make, you know, because each of them is so powerful in their own unique way. And I hadn't seen those different permutations and expressions of selfhood and power in that many, um, in that many genre or non-genre shows. Mm -hmm. And so then you add somebody like this Marvel and it just takes it to the next level. Like, I feel like, you know, the Wonder Woman pose you're supposed to do before a meeting to, <laughs> I'm gonna do the Sharice Newland pose. What's that pose? So I'm murdering you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah she uh she's definitely very sure of herself you know and and we talked about these characters but um what strikes me is while Clayton is still quite patriarchal yeah right we we see 
resonance of that in London, there's none of that. It's gone. It feels like it's gone. I just, yeah. I just realized that now. And the future moment, is female. The future is absolutely <laughs> female, as it should be. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You've had your time. It's our time now. <laughs> Hi, Tiana. What was your preparation to create your character? I'm so sorry, darling. What was your preparation to create your character? Some books, some training? Um, I mean, look, I, I just started with, with what was on the page and talked to the, 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 the writers in Vincenzo and explored that and, and with Greg as well about how they saw her and just kept questioning, but it's so beautifully written, um, these scripts. You can't imagine it, they're so, and of course there's always the edit, so you're not necessarily seeing everything that, that was there and it goes through rewrites and stuff. And actually that helps, that helps to kind of go, okay, well that's out there now, but it's still part of, of her narrative, yeah. of, of the story, of the journey. Um, so it really is just about honoring what what's, what's on the page. And because it is the future, you're sort of not, bound to um anything that's sort of current but the thread is that these are very relatable characters these are very human characters um and so yes that that was the, the linchpin for me thank you with your voice when you're Sharice that's yeah. so intoxicating and powerful and hypnotic what are you doing with your voice that makes it so great? How do you do that? You just turn it on. You say, here's my my slinky Charisse situation. It's There's just some... But that happens though, isn't it? I remember playing a role once and, and I didn't like her voice. I won't say which, which role it was. But every time I spoke as her, I was like, oh God, it's so jarring. But I couldn't for the life of me get out of it. That was just her voice. And I think that's the same thing with Charisse. I find I think it's, it's, the, it's the... It's what's on the page. You're like a snake charmer with that, with that <laughs> voice and the, you know, shoulder pads. Oh, oh gosh, oh. so good. <laughs> oh, that's the other thing. You to answer your question, uh, Michelle Clayton, our gorgeous costume designer. I found my way into Sharice's world very much through the costume in, in this case, because she does have these big shoulder pads and, you know, and those fittings took hours, but they were beautifully spent. And we discovered her and this world together. And so it was a great part of the um, of prepping and finding her in a way that it hasn't been on any other show so far. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, she's great. There's something, is there somebody in the waiting room that wants to be admitted? I don't, oh, okay. It's just popping up on the screen. Okay, so it's over to you now, David. Uh, great. Um, well, uh, to come back to you for for a moment, Sneha, um, I was curious because you've done uh, quite a lot of work in the sci-fi and fantasy genres recently um, with collaborators like Russell T. Davies, Mike Flanagan, and now, of course, Lisa and Jonah. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, what is it about the genre that attracts you and, and what kind of things do you look for in your collaborators? I mean, it's not so much a genre. I've just been fortunate to, to have worked with these amazing people. Um, you know, uh, it really is the writing and, and the role and how much I get to play. Uh, and it's always a conversation with the creators as to what they want. And I am a bit of a people pleaser. I'm that, I'm that little girl at school that just wants to do it right. So after every day, I look at Vincenzo and oh, I go, is that right, right, Joe? <laughs> and it goes, you know, um, but then, uh, unless I feel very strongly about something, like, no, I don't think it's my bad. <laughs> yeah, but, but most of the time, it's it's just like, I just want, I just want to serve the words, for God's sake. Um, yeah, so it's just about interesting characters and interesting story. And does it, does it, is it telling a story? Is it, is it telling them, is it, does it have a message? What's the message? What's the, what's the overall story? Is it going to have an impact? And those are the stories that I'm interested in, in telling the stories that, leave an audience questioning, asking questions, because if it, if it provokes that from me, then it will do the same out there, right? Thank you. Thank you. I think I've become hypnotized by your voice again. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> so pleasant. Uh, it's all the facts. It's so good. <laughs> it's whatever, it's working. 
<laughs> That's an aside. That's not an interview question. <laughs> um, was there? All right. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, this series is set in the future. Uh, is I was curious, is uh, what according to you two is the message from the future in the series? Well, I think, you know, as as Charisse's character knows, she's manipulating everything from like the bees to the world at large. And I think it's really interesting that William Gibson's idea of an apocalypse, or in this case, the jackpot, isn't one giant event, but a um, cascade of smaller events, right? Um, political manipulations and climate change and, uh, you know, colony collapse with bees. And what I think it tells us is the future can look foreboding and it can seem as though we as individuals can't really affect that much. But the truth is the apocalypse doesn't happen like that. It's tiny things compounding. And in each of those things, we have choice and we have agency to shape the world that we want you know, our our next generation to inherit. So I actually think, you know, London is not a dystopian universe. Like mm -hmm. mankind has pulled itself together and kind of hobbled onwards. But but there are also lessons on how to avoid disaster, how to avoid getting to that place. And I find that to be quite hopeful. Yeah. Um when I when I read it, uh or finish reading the my thing was never forget the small man, the so-called small man. Like we're all so interconnected and reliant on each other. This global community that we have is, is it's smaller than we think. And so whatever Mr. Man, whatever we're doing over here, we need to be in conversation and dialogue with that person. And, and it shows us that our current systems where we have just a few people in power. And that's not just of this Western world, because that spreads, right, to those tiny little villages in wherever. It affects them as well, that no one, no one person should have that amount of power. Um, yes, that we do have agency as a collective. Because for most of us, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. Everyone wants to be empowered. Everybody wants to be happy. Everyone wants to feed their kids, pay their bills, right? Yeah. Go out at the weekend or in the week, eat nice food put on some clothes, right? Go running to a jog. Everybody wants the normal basic things in all it means to be human. Um, and sometimes it doesn't feel tangible uh, or that we don't have any agency at all. And those people over there make the decision in the high tower, make those decisions for us. But actually as a collective, we are powerful. How do we get there? That's the question. How do we, how does we look for a more socialist future? or new socialism, I think. Cool. Um, guys, do you have any final questions? We're just a bit short of time now. So if anyone's got uh, any last questions, this, this would be the time. Um, I would... I'll... Oh, sorry. No, Boris, Boris, by all means. Hi, Lisa. Why can you tell us about your collaboration with Vincenzo Natali? Oh, Vincenzo is such a brilliant director. It's it's just a delight to work with him. He he's also this incredible artist. He I remember when I first worked with him on Westworld, he gave me the script back for the episode he directed, and every page he had storyboarded in his own art. Yes. And it was just beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And so when you're dealing with a world or worlds plural like this to have somebody who is so attuned to the aesthetics um and who has such a sensual gaze in his uh camera movements and his uh shot design i think that's really it's a really perfect companion to to scott's writing too which is so textured and layered and kind of human so, you know, honestly, I'm a huge fan of Vincenzo's and Scott. So to see their work together has been excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and Can David, I, uh, oh, just one short question, please. Uh, Vincenzo mentioned that uh, season two and season three is on the cards. Uh, what do you hope to explore in these seasons? What, what was, when who mentioned? <laughs> um, Vincenzo? Uh, I, oh, Vincenzo, I... 
I, uh, I would love to have season two and season three and, and all the seasons in the world to explore this amazing, amazing novel, you know, um, and I, I know we, we've already started brainstorming about season two in the hopes that um, we get a season two and uh, the world only gets more kind of vast and complicated. But the thing that really appeals to me about it is how much deeper we're able to dive into each of the characters' lives and personal lives and ambitions and motivations. To me, that is where it gets really exciting. Mm -hmm. Get ready. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. David, did you want to have a last question if you've got a quick one? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, Lisa, I've just got uh, one for you. I was wondering when you were developing this series, um, did you see any parallels between the peripheral and Westworld uh, in terms of kind of theming? Um, you know, uh, I don't, I, I think it's, it's, it was so different for me in that, you know, uh, when, when you do any kind of sci-fi, you know, there are some, some things that are, you know, in common in terms of just the scope of the world and imagining new technologies and such. But for me, Westworld was so much about the examination of humanity from an AI's vantage point, you know, and thinking about what consciousness is and the responsibilities of consciousness. Whereas meanwhile, the peripheral starts from a wholly different place. It's not an exercise in examining what makes up humanity. You're simply presented with humanity and a very loving family, these very relatable human characters. The question of the peripheral is more, what, is our obligation as people to this world and to each other. You know, I feel like the themes are very emotional and human um, in a sense, and it, and it covers a very different thematic territory than Westworld. Mm. I think they're two different babies. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Cool.